Welcome to part two of the Accident Recovery Team podcast about workers' compensation and medical care. When we left off at the end of part one, Todd and Gary were discussing the ins and outs of getting a second opinion for evidence in a workers' comp claim. You know, we can have as many prelims throughout the course of the case as we need as issues come up. But I got to admit, most of the time, once we have that initial battle, it's not the war, it's that first battle of arguing that this this claim's compensable or this this body part's included or the prevailing factor applies to this and this or this treatment plan or this doctor, that initial battle, once over, and you're into the right kind of treatment with the right people, uh, things can go pretty smooth for a while. Then we get to what's called maximum medical improvement. And I don't know how many times we have to explain to clients, unfortunately, that the statute does not contemplate that they have to fix you. Maximum medical improvement simply means the doctor has reached the point that he kind of shrugs his shoulders, puts his hands up and says, I don't know what else to do. Yeah, a lot of times maximum medical improvement can mean you are back to 100%. But yeah, just as it says, you've reached maximum improvement. And if that's less than 100%, the work comp system doesn't require the insurance company to just keep spending money to do something if the doctors don't think it's gonna yield a better outcome. But different doctors can have different opinions about that issue. Sure. One doctor may say you're at maximum medical improvement, Another doctor may say, hey, we haven't tried this. Right. We, we, we may solicit a second opinion that says, no, 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 they're not at maximum medical improvement. More treatment would be helpful. But if you don't challenge that first doctor's opinion, it's going You're to done. say that. You're done. <laughs> now, there is a distinction between, and, you know, there are some cases where the injury is so significant that, you know, you do go from an active care status, meaning they're still trying to improve you, but you've hit MMI maximum medical improvement, you have plateaued. You're not getting worse. You're not getting better. You're just kind of there you are. There is a concept, though, under work comp called maintenance care. And that's when a doctor on these more significant type claims, even their doctor, or sometimes we argue about it. Sometimes it's our doctor that makes that decision, and then the judge decides. But people can be put in maintenance care that is still covered by work comp, It's just that the MMI means that it's a snapshot in time where the court system is saying, we're not going to wait forever to find out the ultimate end game to this injury, which could be five, six, seven, eight years down the road. Um, Once you plateau, you're not getting better, you're not getting worse, we're going to take a snapshot in time and we're going to figure out what kind of damages you're entitled to. Are you going to need maintenance care? Future care, because we're going to, we'll get into that too. So this MMI status is important for a number of reasons. The first of which requires us to back up. During the course of treatment, a doctor can give you an off work slip. And that's a no brainer. A doctor has taken you off work. That means that the work comp insurance company is gonna owe you a wage replacement, which is referred to as a temporary total disability weekly check. If you've been off work more than a week, remember I, there's that I waiting was, period. <laughs> I was going to let you dive I, into oh, that. Well, Explain the waiting period and then the sure. following three weeks. All right. Yeah, under the work comp system, if an employee is off misses work because of restrictions associated with the injury, as mm-hmm. as provided by the authorized treating doctor, it can't be just any doctor. It has to be the authorized doctor. If you're off work for less than five days under the work comp system, you don't get reimbursed for in this thing called temporary total disability. What that is is a check that equates to two thirds of what your pre-injury average weekly wage had been. And they'll look at- Off gross numbers. uh, Off, right, before taxes are taken out, before withholding of any sort. Uh, And they'll go back and look at 26 weeks of work, about six months before you got injured. They should include if there's, uh, well, obviously base pay, but if there's overtime, shift differentials. Bonuses. Bonuses, and that actually goes back 12 months. Um, So the full average. That's right, and again, the higher the, the, the more you were getting paid before you got hurt, the higher your two-thirds TTD, temporary total disability check, will be. But yeah, you're right. That kicks in only after you've been off work five days, one week. Then it starts at the beginning of the second week. But if you're off work for three weeks and there's some judges, well, that, yeah, that, 
That's a right. point of contention, but yes. Yeah, so if you're off work, you know, 10 days here and then another two weeks, again, that, that's a point that can be argued. But you're right. I think the way the statute reads is three consecutive weeks. Then at that point, the waiting period it goes away. So now, once you hit that three-week mark, they have to pay for that first week, the waiting period week. And that would continue on for however long you're off work. But again, that's dependent on the restrictions or limitations. That well, right now, we're just talking about an off work slip. Just uh, right. off work. So we're, we'll get into restrictions in a minute. We got an okay. off work slip oh, right now. Our hypothetical is oh. the doctor has taken you off work. So you are, there's no question, you're entitled to the off work benefit. Okay. And you've kind of explained the pre injury average calculation. Two thirds of that is what you would receive. Okay. Now there is a cap. <laughs> and this cap is changed and adjusted every year, right? Correct. Um, I'll even concede as I sit here right now. Where are we at? Six seventy six. I think it's six sixty one. I say I know. I know for the year ending June thirtieth, twenty nineteen, it was six forty five. Mm -hmm. I didn't bring the chart that showed what it was for night. Yeah, every July first it changes. Yeah. But my recollection was for July first, two thousand nineteen, through June thirtieth, two thousand twenty, the maximum was six sixty one per week. So when we have somebody that we tell them. Two thirds of their gross is what you would receive while you're off work, and they think, "Oh, that's about my take-home pay," uh, and I take home about twelve hundred dollars a week doing that. Uh, they're going to be disappointed to find, yeah. well, the bad news is it's capped at six sixty-one. So that's an off work slip. Right. That's pretty simple. That that's not a hard argument to convince the judge. Things that get more complicated is when the doctor says. I'm not taking you off work, but you can go back to work subject to restrictions. And I, constantly we have disputes between the employer saying we're accommodating the restriction and the injured worker saying, no, they're not, right? Um, that's oftentimes a hard battle to have at a preliminary hearing because the judge does have no idea what you're doing at work. Um, but that... The, the, the advice I give for folks is that we don't want to have a full-blown hearing probably over if the thing you're carrying weighs 26 pounds and you have a 25-pound weight limit. You're saying it's 26. They say it's 24. That's not something we want to have in front of the judge. That's a it's a argument that the judge is going to look at us and go, really? That's why we're here? <laughs> um, I tell folks most of the time, if you think the employer isn't following the restriction, your first course should be go back to the doctor that gave the restriction, talk to him about that, talk to him about what specifically is the issue that's that's contested. You'll find out fairly quickly, folks, if that doctor is listening to you as a patient or if he's listening to the insurance company and you're just another folder for him. Um, if he says, that's between you and your employer, we probably need to look at trying to find another doctor or get another opinion. What the doctor should do is say, no, no, no. I want you to get better while we're in treatment, not worse from doing these things. If there's a dispute as to whether that item weighs 25 or 26 pounds and I've given you a 25 pound limit, tell you what, we're gonna nip that in the bud right now and I'm gonna give you a 15 pound limit then because yeah. I don't wanna take any chance. That's what the doctor should do when there's those kind of disputes. But how often does that happen? Not as often as I would like, <laughs> that's for sure. Because you're right, I mean, the doctor can do one of three things with those limits. He can say, you're back to work full duty, which is a no-brainer. There's not limitations on your activity because of the injury, so you should be back at work. He can say, off work entirely, which as you say, is a no-brainer. But most of the time, I think most doctors do try to find that middle ground. I've had patients or clients come to me and say, well, the doctor said work comp won't let me take you off work for entirely. I have to give you restrictions. Well, first of all, what's work comp? The work comp laws don't say that. The work comp law says you're the doctor, you tell us what's appropriate. Right. But if they say work comp, are they talking about the insurance company? Are they and again, this isn't saying you're not getting good medical care, but most no, of the doctors it, that do this know it comes back to my original comment, which was they have the right to appoint the doctor, not control him. And this is a perfect example where these doctors will frankly admit to you that I would rather do this, but the insurance company won't let me. It's a, it's a perfect example of that. So we dive into issues all the time. If it's not a full duty slip or an off work slip, if it's that restriction slip, many times we're having to 
get clarification as to what the restrictions really are, arguments, or is the employer following them or not. Sometimes it ends up at a prelim, sometimes it doesn't, but the point that I like to make to folks is, that is that's not where you wanna win the war. That's a battle in the war, and I don't want you to get fired in the middle of the case over an argument about clarifying restrictions. That's not the place to have that, that argument. If it really comes down to it, sometimes you choose to work, sometimes you choose not to, and we have to argue about it, that's fine. Whatever our client wants to do, I will address it that way. But uh, I, I don't think that, that the judge enjoys those types of things in his courtroom. And I don't want the client to get fired over that kind of, uh, I don't want to call it trivial because it's not. It's a significant issue. You're hurting, but you're being forced to work. But um, yeah, it's not that the judges aren't sympathetic, but you're, you're, playing, you're, you're, I think, hitting on a really, really good point. Part of why you go to an attorney is because they have some experiences about what type of issues are probably going to be winners in front of a judge. I mean, it all depends on the facts, right? Sure. But Every, judges are people too. And it's not just a matter of, of how you present the evidence, it's knowing what battles to fight and when to fight them. Uh, because perhaps that's something that should be saved for negotiation at the end of the uh, at the end of the case when you're trying to see if you can make some type of, uh, of settlement proposal or a judge has a right to go back uh, when it's time to make an award and address some of those issues. So sometimes we're better off negotiating at the time of settlement for something that during the course of the case would have been an iffy proposition. You want to go in when you're most prepared to get the best result you can for the client. Sometimes uh, wait until you get another report, maybe from a court or a doctor. It's, you know, it, it's, there's not necessarily a right or wrong answer. You kind of learn to, how to evaluate things as you, as you go through and do this more and more. And, you know, at the end of the day, if you're an injured worker, you probably, you know, don't have that background, that experience, but the insurance no. company sure does. Their sure. adjusters do and the attorneys they have representing them do. So that's exactly right. They, the issue of, of getting the TTD, that off work benefit started, that's what we deal with is that they know the game plan and you don't, right? And, but those are the issues that we have to tackle to make sure that if you're off work or need to be off work, that's what we have to wrestle with. I will just quick, we're gonna quickly move on, but I wanted to, before we do, point out, there's also something called a temporary partial disability benefit, which means you've returned to work, but maybe at fewer hours, or to accommodate your restrictions, you've been put in a position maybe that pays less per hour, something like that. So you are working, you're just making less money, there's a benefit that would pay for two thirds of that lost money. That's right. You still have the one week waiting period you have to get past. But yes, that's temporary partial disability because you're not totally off work. You're partially disabled, right. partially off work. So we talked about treatment up to the point of maximum medical improvement. We then stepped out and talked about how during the course of treatment, you may or may not be off work and that there are benefits to address that and what those issues might be. These two things can reconverge <laughs> when the doctor says you're at maximum medical improvement you're done with active care, like we talked about, that means your entitlement to any of those off work checks ends. You're, you're done. Whether you're back to work or not, those checks stop. And if you're back to work at the end of treatment, if the doctor says, here's your final set of restrictions, go back to work, and they say, yeah, we got work for you, fantastic. If that's not happening, if you get to the end of treatment, the doctor says, here's your final set of restrictions, your employer's not putting you back to work, and your weekly checks have now stopped, you're in what I call the black hole. There's no money coming to yeah. you until the case is either awarded or settled. Right. So we wanna move as quickly as we can through that period of time. Um, so let's play the end game for a second. You reach maximum medical improvement, temporary benefits have stopped, the doctor gives you restrictions and your functional impairment rating. And that is basically a number that is expressed as a percentage. And it's generated under either, well, right now, it, it's generated under what's called the sixth edition of the American Medical Association Guidelines to the Evaluation of Permanent Impairment. Well said. How, well, I, I don't know that I could say it again, but I got it out <laughs> right the first time. For years and years, it had been 
Kansas had followed the fourth edition, not the sixth edition of the guides. And there's actually a case called um, Johnson versus... Well, the Johnson case. The Johnson I case. I will John point out, I think the oral arguments at the Kansas Supreme Court occurred today. Boy, well, and they being September 16th to... No, not, September 17th. Not knowing exactly when this yeah, right. recorded event will air, but, I mean, as we said here, at the time of recording anyway... But to give everybody an idea, there was a... Can the Kansas Court of Appeals, the second highest court in the land, said more than two years ago that the sixth edition that had been implemented, I think, in 20, 2015 was um, not fair, was not... Unconstitutional. Yeah, basically, basically. It didn't give injured workers a fair shake like the fourth edition did. So they said the sixth edition should be gone. We should revert back to the fourth. That has been appealed up to the Kansas Supreme Court. As Todd indicated, it's taken two years before they have oral argument. So it could be another year, maybe less, hopefully, before we get a decision from the Kansas Supreme Court. But right now, the sixth edition is still the law of the land. But at a certain point, the fourth edition may come in. Does it make a difference to you as an injured worker? It probably does, because under most circumstances, the fourth edition gives you a higher impairment rating. But this is all nerdy lawyer stuff. The thing to know is this impairment rating <laughs> is a way for the work comp system to put a dollar value on the functional impairment, the loss of ability that you've sustained as a result of this injury. What do they pay for pain and suffering under work comp? Nothing. Zilch zero. Is that fair? Heck no. Is it black letter law that we can't do anything about? I'm sorry to say it is. Right. So you want to make sure you get a comprehensive, fair rating from a uh, in your impairment rating. And, uh, and the insurance company will procure a rating, or many times, they don't have to. They can't sit back and wait and see if you as an injured worker do anything about it. I've seen that more times than I can count. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I, I think of it this way. For every 10 people that the insurance company flat out ignores, four of them they'll never hear from again. And they just saved that much money. Right. They just say, hey, we paid your benefits. You're, you've been released by the doctor. Have a good life. And, and some people don't know otherwise or they know otherwise, but they don't know what to do about it. Um, I, I'm guessing four out of ten people that they ignore, they never hear from again. Uh, the rest of them call people like us and get paid. Um, but you're right. The doctor will, the treating doctor typically, but not always. Then sometimes they'll hire somebody else, the insurance company will, and get a rating. Um it is incumbent to understand that that rating is probably undervaluing your case. Yeah. It's an opinion from a doctor that again, it is. wants it, more business being sent to them by the insurance company. And you would think that just because the statute says, use this book to calculate the rating, that there would be some consistency. But even within the AMA guides to the evaluation of permanent impairment, there are different methods to, you can use to rate people, both of which are acceptable by the court, and so when the insurance company's doctor, for example, would use a diagnostic-based table to come up with a rating, another doctor could use the exact same book and use a clinical-based method to come up with a different rating. And surprise, surprise, what pattern do we see? Insurance company doctors tend to use the rating that produces lower numbers. Uh, our experts tend to try and use the other method, and, which is clinical. And this is why I think it's more fair. If I line up five guys that had the exact same injury and the exact same surgery performed, what is the likelihood that all five of them came out with the exact same result? It's not. Yeah. People have different results from injuries. People have different results from their treatment. Those five guys are going to clinically present differently. Therefore, they should be rated differently. You can't use the diagnostic method to come in and say, you're all the same. That's not fair. The clinical method, I feel, is more accurate because it takes into account actual clinical findings. What is your range of motion? What is your strength? Is there crepitus or laxity in the joint? Those are things particular to that person. That's how the injury affected you. I digress. <laughs> <laughs> they have a rating. We have a rating. Uh, typically, we know that if we present that to a judge and take the three or four months to litigate, that the judge would likely pick something in the middle. Um, well, just to digress again, because honestly, one of the really important things is not just how much rating there is to the injured body part, it's what body part is hurt. Let's say you have uh, an injury that's been diagnosed as an injury to your shoulder, uh, maybe a rotator cuff issue. Most of the time, not always, I'm talking generalities, but an insurance company would be more 
willing to authorize a doctor to treat the shoulder. But if you're having issues that are going up into your neck, as a as a injured worker, you you've just don't identified. Give a diagnosis. Yeah, you've it, identified a classic scenario where we're back to is it a scheduled injury or body, and they'll do everything to avoid a body injury. That's right. And and you know, at the end of the day, it's not what the adjuster says it is. It's not what me as the smart lawyer thinks it is. It's not what the patient says it is. It's getting a medical opinion that evidence that that's what's going to move the needle on persuading the judge one way or the other. But the point is, if you go to the authorized doctor, they treat the shoulder, they may be willing to do that. But if you're having issues with the neck, getting a second opinion not only can make sure you're getting a proper evaluation of the neck. If there is an issue, I'm sorry, with regard to the shoulder, not only do you have a proper evaluation of that, but if there is an issue with the neck, that now is brought in. That can have not only a huge effect on how well you recover, because if it's not getting treated, it's probably not going to get any better. But also it goes to the value of the case. Big time. Honestly, to a certain extent, it depends on the circumstances, it can depend on whether the employer will try to accommodate restrictions and keep you on the job. Because if you have a shoulder injury and you have restrictions and they don't bring you back to work. Well, we'll get into that. I don't want to jump ahead. Okay. I know where you're it's going, Gary. Your I know how your it's brain a, works. It's a big sticky ball of legal And we will sort food. through it directly. Okay, so <laughs> okay. yes, the you know high ratings, low ratings on body parts that we're not disputing, that's a fairly simple concept. The judge is going to look at, we all agree this is, for example, as you said, a shoulder. You got a rating, we got a rating, the judge isn't going to spend, path of least resistance, right? The judge isn't going to spend a lot of time on this. He's going to say, oh, you've got a 10 and you've got a 20% impairment rating? I'm no doctor. I'm going to call it a 15. He has that power, mm -hmm. or she. Um, and many times that's exactly what they'll do, is give equal credence to the two medical opinions before them. Well, again, that's where it goes back if you have a doctor that the judge is familiar with. If you go to your primary yep. care doctor, they don't know. They have the authority to say, well, I'm going to disregard this. I'm yeah, I don't know if he knows how to rate people right. under the AMA guides. Right. So that's not a hard thing to wrestle with. Where we run into the bigger issue is at that point in time, the maximum medical improvement. Here comes the ratings as to the body parts is like you point out, wait a minute. Now we got a dispute between this is a shoulder or whatever. Uh, and ours is no, it's a shoulder and a neck. Right. Or some dispute about prevailing factor about something, some aspect of the injury. The judge has the authority, before you even get to trial, there's a concept called a pretrial conference. And at that point, you know, when the, when the attorneys are presenting to the judge, hey, here's our evidence, this is our position, these are the things that we're not arguing about, these are the things we are arguing about. That's a short version of a settlement conference, right. pretrial settlement conference. When the judge is sometimes presented with that, he might say, hey, look, before we go to trial, you guys are way far apart on what's wrong with this person or what the ratings are. The judge has the authority to order what's called a court-ordered independent medical examination, <laughs> which, by the way, he could also do at any prelim along the way Correct. when there's a dispute about treatment or something. So presented with... a disparity of opinions, the judge can invoke this court-neutral doctor. He's going to reach out to somebody he knows. It's on an approved list held by the Division of Work Comp out of Topeka. Uh, somebody that is neutral, that hasn't been hired by either party, and he can ask that doctor to address whatever that disputed issue might be. The judge is not bound to follow that opinion in his ultimate decision, but as I've had to explain to clients many, many times, the likelihood that they will is pretty high. The more disputed it is, that means in litigation, I'm going to be throwing dirt at their uh, medical opinion expert, and they're going to be throwing at mine. Right. And the, the murkier the water gets, the more the judge is inclined to go, well, I'm going with the one I picked. Right, because he's not beholden to Todd and Gary or to the insurance company. That's right. So this court neutral doctor sometimes can can make the difference on, on where these things land. The reason that we talked about, you gotta know what your issues are gonna be on day one, comes home to roost right here. Because if the doctor says, yeah, this is a body case, it's not a limb case, and we're in a situation where the employer has not yet decided whether to bring them back to work or not, 
or maybe decided they're not going to bring him back to work. That is hugely significant. Ex explain to everybody why. Well, because under if you have a scheduled injury, basically what you're entitled to once the case is resolved is uh, an amount of money based on the functional impairment, that rating you get from the doctor, uh, and that's it. It doesn't you take into consideration. for the physical injury done. It does not affect your ability to, it does not take into consideration your ability to continue working in that or heck in any job. Um, it doesn't affect, it doesn't take into consideration your ability to enjoy hobbies or, or, or do anything else. It's just based on that rating and the injury itself. However, if it's a general body injury, for instance, the neck is involved or the parallel limbs, both ankles, both knees, both wrists, as an example, um, if you have more than a certain amount of impairment, there's a threshold you have to be over. Over 7.5% currently. That's what the law says yeah, right now. Right. Um, then basically the price of poker goes up because if you're not able to go back to work at that or any other job earning at least 90% of what you were earning before, the method by which the judge calculates your benefits is much different. Now it's not just based on a percentage reflecting how much loss of function you have, but it looks at, it's, it's called a work disability analysis. And they look at both your ability to earn wages now, given the current restrictions you have. It's, it's a comparison of your pre-injury wage to now what is your wage earning capability. Right, it's called wage loss. And then also task loss. They look at, that's where when we visited with Mr. Harden, or maybe we'll be visiting we'll, with Mr. Well, I've Harden. I've got a call out. Right, exactly. Hopefully we can we can get Paul Harden in to explain this in a little bit better detail. But what, what they do is they, you have to have a vocational expert examine the type of work you physically performed in the five years preceding your date of injury. And let's say for an example, you did 25 different tasks in the opinion of the expert, and now you can only do 10 of those tasks. I should use numbers that give me a better. Well, but, but. Let, let's not steal his thunder. Let's, okay. but, but right, yeah, it's, it, it really comes down to that there is, beyond getting paid for the injury, there is that other category of damages called a work disability. It's out there. There's a thresh, couple of thresholds to get there. One is that you can't have a schedule injury. You gotta have that body injury. That's why from day one, the, the, very, the minute you get hurt and you start seeing the doctor, that's where I was saying, you need to start your battle there from day one where you're saying, hey, don't forget this body part hurts too, doc. Make sure you look at that. Um, because if you're over those thresholds and can get into that other category, it may come down to a court neutral doctor deciding, right. is this other body part included or not? And it might mean that the value of the case, economic value of the award you get could be significantly higher, but it also could mean that the employer is gonna have more of an incentive to try to accommodate your restrictions. And, keep and you bring working. It, exactly, because now they don't have to pay the higher work yeah. disability award, they still have to pay the functional impairment, does it guarantee you're going to have a job? No. I know. I know that their attorney, representing the employer and its insurance company, is certainly going to go to the employer and say, "Hey, you need to keep this guy. Don't fire him over this. Keep him working, because if you don't, the accident recovery team is going to come after us for all this lost wage. It's called a work disability. Uh, I, I know for a fact that they will go report back, and that's the incentive you're talking about: is the employer being told by their attorney." that they need to keep you, otherwise the case is gonna be worth a lot more money. Yeah, whereas if you have a scheduled injury, it doesn't mean you're gonna get fired if you have a scheduled injury, it doesn't mean you're not gonna get fired if you have a general body injury, but the reality is there's no penalty for the employer as far as what they have to pay in work comp benefits, saying we're not gonna accommodate these restrictions and letting you go if it's a scheduled injury, whereas there is a huge incentive for them to keep you working if you're general body, if you have a general body injury. So knowing that and making sure all these things are looked at, building a case to try to give you as the injured worker the best chance to get all the treatment you need to address all of your problems, but also preserve your job while getting the maximum payout, payout that you can under the statute is something, frankly, you generally can only get through an attorney. Let's try and wrap this one up. Treatment, uh, you know, it raises the issues of getting the right kind of treatment, the right body parts, causation. It takes us through to the rating system, the final set of restrictions that can impact your ability to return to work. This treatment phase of the case is, is monumentally important as the foundation of what could ultimately be the value of your case. The last thing, though, that the doctor needs to address is 
as they release you from care, what about future medical needs? You know, Related people, to the accident. Absolutely. People ask me all the time, yeah, but what about a year from now? What about two years from now? And the answer to that is that the judge does have the authority under the current law to award you the right. I don't want to call it the right to medical care because it's really not. It's the right to return in front of the judge and ask for more care. And it's a two-year window. It doesn't mean two years to file the request. It's two years to get the file requested or you know, to get it filed and be standing in front of the judge within two years to make that request. Um, two years from the date, I think you're released from care by the doctor. So once they find you to be at maximum medical improvement, that's when that two-year window for asking for additional medical care. So, okay. you know, we, we want to, if we can, present. It's not automatic. He doesn't just, we got to win that. It used to be. It used Back to be. Back before yeah. 2011. <laughs> I'll go but now, again. now you got to win it, which means we have to have doctors' opinions to support that. I have found, since the change in the law, that the, most judges uh, are... Um, you know, they're not too Machiavellian about it. I mean, they're, I, I think they're, they look for the evidence so that they can justify leaving the medical open most of the time. But if it's a disputed issue, if it's a disputed issue and you got one doctor saying, no, they don't need it, another says, yes, they do, and the judge is on the fence about it, and that court neutral doctor comes down and says, no, you really run the risk that at trial you won't get it. Right. So in settlement negotiating, uh, you can you can try to negotiate a settlement where the medical stays open, or you can relinquish that claim for future medical, uh, maybe for more money, and walk away. That two year mark is problematic. It it, it means you know if a doctor releases you and says, by the way, you're going to need a knee replacement in three years. Well, that's problematic. You only have two years to come in and ask for treatment, but you don't need it yet. Uh, I think procedurally, the answer to that is we have to keep filing those motions if, if the client wants us to. Yeah, just to go get checked out by the doctor because that two-year clock resets yeah, every time. It, it resets it. You kick the can down the road a little ways. But what people have to understand is I can't file that motion without merit. I can't just file it for, you know, giggles. Yeah. My we client has to call change me. In circumstance. Well, well, well one is my client has to ask me for it. I can't file it and say, hey, I did this for you. <laughs> you know, I, they have to ask me for it. That's right. And then two, I have to present some evidence that we need it. So it's a little bit problematic when a client's otherwise doing fine, but we know that, that down the road, the doctor has already said they're going to need another surgery. Anyway, all right. I could go on and on and on. <laughs> That's what nerd lawyers do. We, we, <laughs> Gary and I could just keep on talking about this, folks. I apologize. From a treatment standpoint, that, that's kind of the end of the road for the treating, the authorized treating doctors and our hired experts and the court's independent examiner appointments. Along the road of your work comp case, that's kind of the end of their involvement. Where we're going to go next would be to talk about that, what we just hinted at, this, you know, there's the payment for the physical injury. That's, that's fine. But if they don't bring you back to work, there's something called a work disability, which is an entirely different animal that we're going to bring somebody in to explain it, uh, an expert um, that can do so better than Gary and I, and we will well, turn the table and uh, let him take the lead on it. And we will do that in our next episode. Gary, I'm done. What do you think? Yeah, I think uh, I think most people listening to this would agree that, yeah, we're done. Yeah. <laughs> I, need, I need a Diet Mountain Dew. How's that sound? <laughs> Uh, I probably could use something a little stronger, but, right. you know, fine. Folks, thank you. Um, tune in next time. We're going to have another episode. We're going to cover the work disability under Kansas work comp law. Goodbye. Goodbye. The lawyers of the accident recovery team are licensed in Kansas and Kansas only. If you are unfortunate enough to live somewhere other than the great state of Kansas and have questions about an auto accident or an injury accident of any kind, you can still call the accident recovery team and we can partner with an attorney in your state to help you get the representation you need. The accident recovery team can be found at 267team.com or by calling 267-TEAM.